Well, here we are in uh, number three of Back to the Basics, uh, which was prompted by our conversation in uh, with the Book of Revelation and the release of the Gallup poll of saying that those of us who are in uh, even members in a faith community are now a minority of the U.S. population. So we said, what does it mean to be a part of a minority movement now? And then I've sort of prepared this in the sense that, well, then I think that means we got to get back to the basics. And we've considered the first basic is that we are a we community, not an I community. We work together for the sake of sharing God's love with all, including the marginalized. That's the first basic. The second basic is we commit ourselves to this higher cause even though we have differences of opinion and difference in knowledge and difference in beliefs, th those can be set aside as we work together uh, for the sake of the higher cause. But thirdly, there's a third basic, and that is what we're gonna deal with this morning and this week is that a faithful community is anchored in Jesus and the core of his life and teaching was the act of forgiveness. Uh, you, you can't talk about the basics of a Christian community without talking about Jesus, and you can't talk about Jesus without talking about the, the foundation of, of forgiveness in his life and teachings. Now, um, we'll get back to that in, in a couple minutes, but let's recall the primary danger of being in the majority is the inclination of the church and really historically the proven reality that when we're in the majority, we're likely to conform to the values of the world. Now, this is a key uh, point in Paul's letter to the Romans. Now, when we talk about the church in 95 AD or the church in 1739 AD, Romans becomes pretty important because in 95 AD, the book of Romans had been around for uh, a generation and a half. It was a classic in Christian literature even then because Romans is the only book that Paul wrote before he went to the church. All of the other letters that Paul wrote was in response to a problem in the church and, and how that problem could be overcome in the young Christian communities. He had never been to Rome. Rome was sort of his presentation of his faith, his beliefs, his values before he got there. He sort of introduced himself and so this became a very important early book in, in the Christian community and was a pretty well communicated and pretty well read. Now, <clears throat> Paul, towards the end of the book of Romans, has a profound statement, and that is, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you might prove what the will of God is, that which is good, acceptable, and perfect. That's in Romans 12, the second verse. Now let me paraphrase that, if you will. It might be said, do not conform to the ways of the majority. Paul's letter was basic to the church as the minority in 95 AD. And when we read about John Wesley, we realize that the book of Romans was formative for John Wesley in his own experience of renewal and his leadership in this minority movement called Methodist in 1739. So to consider the basics, we, we turn to the centrality of forgiveness in Jesus' life and teachings. Um, forgiveness for all, regardless of who they are, what they've done, including the marginalized, <clears throat> forgiveness for all. 
conforming to the world of polarization, conforming to the world of vindictiveness, conforming to the world that values judgment above all, and conforming to the world that seemingly requires that we have an enemy in order to really enjoy living. Now, that's, that's not the way of Jesus, conforming to that kind of world. And in 95 AD, they had the choice of whether or not they were going to conform to that world by the mark of the beast. In 1739, that they had a choice of conforming to the world that, that simply was one of authoritarian understanding of leadership and community. And uh, certainly when the movement became a church in the United States, they had a choice of how they would uh, respond in terms of their own life together. And they chose not to conform to the world, but to be transformed. And transformed is Jesus' life and ministry. Considered a woman taken in adultery. The ones that are without sin can cast the first stone. And then to the woman, you're forgiven. Consider the, the Jesus' words on the cross. He was being crucified. He said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Consider his teaching in the Lord's Prayer that has the centrality, belief, understanding, the transforming experience of forgiveness at the heart of the Lord's Prayer. Consider Maddie's sermon last Sunday based on the <clears throat> uh, writings of John and in the appearances of Jesus after the resurrection, John included the admonition of Jesus to forgive. So you just can't get away from forgiveness if we're talking about Jesus. And therefore, it sort of seems like to me that maybe the faithful communities of Christ scattered throughout are to be known and experienced as the centers of Christian forgiveness. That's one of the basics. Now, I want to take the time to unpack forgiveness because uh, I think it's, it's difficult for us to grab hold of the centrality of this and the depth of it. And so there are two basic understandings of forgiveness that I think we need to look at. And the first is that forgiveness does not negate the reality of justice and judgment. Forgiveness does not negate the reality of judgment and justice. One must experience the consequences of their behavior. That's what justice is all about. That's what judgment is all about. Uh, 50 years ago, and some of you have heard me share the story of when Chaplain Post, uh, I invited Chaplain Post to speak to a youth rally in Oakley, Kansas. And uh, uh, he was the chaplain of the murderers of the Clutter family in Garden City that held the, the mind of the Western Kansas community uh, when, that, when those murders occurred. So he came out with a message to thousand youth <clears throat> sitting uh, on the floor all over because there weren't enough seats in the gymnasium at uh, Oakley High School. This is what he said. These men will be executed. <clears throat> they will be put to death by the state. But they will be forgiven. He said, I Forgive them. At that point, one had accepted 
Taplin Post's gift of forgiveness, the other had not. And he told the story. From that time on, I've had an understanding because of the gift of Chaplain Post in my life that whether forgiveness is accepted is up to the one to whom forgiveness is given. <clears throat> whether or not it's offered is up to the one who forgives. And to offer forgiveness is to follow Jesus for the relationship of agape, unconditional love. The foundation of that is forgiveness. If you will, forgiveness is the portal, the open door to the understanding of unconditional love. Forgiveness is not dealing with consequences. Consequences are real. Justice is real. Judgment is, is real. But forgiveness is about relationships, not about consequences. The relationship between God and persons and the relationship between persons. Um, I've got to tell another story. Um, <clears throat> when I became pastor at Woodlawn Church in Derby, I had discovered that a few years previous to that, uh, the Fellowship Hall uh, had a disastrous fire. Everything was burned except for the brick walls that remained. It was quickly discovered that the fire was set by uh, uh, a boy, I believe he was in the sixth grade, maybe 12 years old, and he had gained access at night into the fellowship hall and was in the attic and had a lit candle to show him the way through the attic and the flame ignited some substance in the attic and luckily he knew how to get out the way he got in, but the church building burned. Uh, you can imagine as it went through the community. Uh, what in the world is this family doing, letting that kid out at night, going up and how'd he get into the fellowship? Why'd he get in there? What's he doing with an open candle? All that kind of conversation. But within hours after the identification of the young man was made known, um, a person that became a dear, dear friend of mine, but this happened before I knew him, he decided he was gonna to go to this family. He knocked on the door and, and the family knew him and knew he was a part of the church and with fear and trepidation, they invited him in. There were the parents and this 12 year old boy. And Bill expressed his understanding his care and love for them, used the word forgiveness and said, I forgive you, the church will forgive you. I hope that this can become a part of your family life that you can move on from and have a, a, a re, new relationship with each other. I just want to let you know I'm going to drop by again because you're my friends. That young man suffers some consequence in terms of juvenile court. But he also received the gift of forgiveness, which was the portal to the first time that family had ever experienced unconditional love and it became the foundation of their family life from that point on. You see, forgiveness is the portal to unconditional love and it does not 
eliminate the reality of consequences. But forgiveness is not about consequences. Forgiveness is about relationships. The relationship with God, with persons, and the relationship we have with each other. But the second thing we must remember about forgiveness is that it does not require forgetting. Forgive and forget is not the Christian gospel. Jesus taught us to forgive. <laughs> he didn't teach us to forget. Um, again, the, the story that changed my life is that lay person in Liberia that stood before a couple thousand people probably and part of those couple thousand people were, were the rebels that had killed his wife and three children and laughed at him as they refused to kill him so that he would have to live with the memory of his family's death. You talk about cruel. And he stood before that crowd among whom the rebels sat and he said, I forgive you. And he meant it with tears in his eyes. He said, because if I do not forgive you, that creates a distance between me and my God. For as God has forgiven me, I forgive you because I'm not going to allow you to separate me from my God. Remember and forgive is the way of love, not forgive and forget. So let's remember about Jesus' life and about forgiveness. It's the portal of unconditional love. And forgiveness is remembering, not forgetting. Yes, we're a minority. I think we can learn from the witness of the church as a minority in 95 and AD and 17, 39 AD and be in the 18th century. We can live by the basics. We can be known as those folks are together. They're all about we, not just narcissistic being about I. They live and they're in mission with those with whom they disagree. And finally, they are forgiven and they are forgiving. In Paul's world, they don't list, they don't conform to the ways of the majority. They're transformed by the renewal of their lives as they follow the man named Jesus. I submit those as some basics that we who are in the minority should consider about our life together. Now for your thoughts and for our discussion Sunday, the first question is, when did you and from whom did you first discover the portal to unconditional love? That is the act of forgiveness. And secondly, what are the barriers to the Christian community becoming the center of Christian forgiveness? A lot to think about. We'll talk about it Sunday. <laughs>